With every new generation, the church works to find new ways to reach and relate to young people. Different movements and fads have sought to answer the question, what is the secret to reaching the next generation for Christ? And although this instinct isn't bad, the real answer might be both easier and harder than we think. My guest today is Kevin DeYoung, and he shares his answer to that question, a question he's been asked many times over the years. While acknowledging the rise of the nuns and the increasing power and influence of technology over young people's lives, DeYoung encourages pastors and youth leaders to remember that our fundamental mission as believers has not changed, and that reaching the next generation will not be done through relevant pop culture references or harnessing the power of the newest social media platform but rather by loving the next generation and teaching them the truth and power of the gospel. Kevin is the senior pastor at Christ Covenant Church in Matthews, North Carolina, an associate professor of systematic theology at Reformed Theological Seminary. He has written books for children, adults, and academics, including his newest book with Crossway, The Not-So-Secret Secret to Reaching the Next Generation. Let's get started. Well, Kevin, thanks for joining me again on the Crossway Podcast. Always good to be with you. So, Kevin, since the Great Commission, I would say, Christians have undoubtedly been devoting themselves to uh, the task of making disciples, right? We, we spend a lot of time and thought thinking about how to win people for Christ. And throughout history, we see different strategies and different methods and emphases when it comes to thinking about what it means to, to win someone to Christ. Uh, and I, I wonder, if, wonder if you can set us up for today, and how would you summarize what our approach to that has been like as Christians? One way to answer that question, and it will lead in probably to the rest of our conversation, is to think whether our efforts to bring people into the church, disciple them, win them to Christ, is that task mainly the same as it's always been, mm. or is it going to be vastly different from age to age or generation to generation. There's always some level of, no one's gonna say, hopefully just repristinate the 15th century mm-hmm. or something. And hopefully every evangelical is gonna say, well, the message is still the same. But in terms of the task and the strategy and what to do, I think the last 50 years in particular in North American evangelicalism, what I would know best, has leaned pretty hard into the, we really got to do things in a totally different way. Mm. Uh, some books have had that kind of title even, Change or Die. Yeah. Uh, so you think of the, the Seeker Sensitive Movement, which has a kind of popular level, but before that it had a, a, you know, an academic theoretical Level and a lot yeah. of that coming out of you know Fuller Sem- Seminary or Donald McGravin. And there was intentional strategy there was, behind that's it. That's right. It it was a homogenous unit principle, or it was we really need to understand the culture. So there was a time where people did cultural you know surveys. Mm. You know, survey your neighbors, find what they would want in a church. What are the felt needs that are dominant in their minds? Yeah. So that I think has been woven pretty deep into a lot of how evangelicals think, that if we are to reach the next generation of utmost importance is to understand the movies they're watching. And so we maybe even need to watch all the movies, even if they're garbage. We need to understand the way that they think. We need to understand their objections. We need to know even their tastes, their preferences. Mm. And we need to find the maximum cultural bridges that would allow them to come over yeah. into the faith. So I know how much of that too is is predicated on this growing sense that the chasm separating Christians from non-Christians is growing bigger and bigger and even that you know, Christians are losing ground in the culture broadly. Is that part of it where over the last few decades we've just sensed that Christianity has lost its influence over the culture that maybe we once felt like it enjoyed. I think it's certainly that and that is just growing exponentially that the the same old ways of doing things or saying the same old things isn't going to work anymore. Yeah. And, and we'll get to that. There's an element of, of truth there. But I think it's also the way in which we now think of generations. And I do believe that there are 
generational differences that are driven by events and technology. So there's certainly things to learn from that. But I, but it seems to me in the last 50 or 60 years, that has become mm. paramount in many people's minds so that a baby boomer and a Gen X. See, when I was growing up, you know, I'm a Gen X. It was my people that the mm-hmm. church was trying to reach. And I mean, I have lots of funny remembrances of baby boomers. Like, <laughs> we're not going to reach you, you college students, unless we, um, I get up here with my guitar and play Shine Jesus Shine. No, actually, that's not winning any college students, <laughs> even when I was a college student. So we tend to kind of see the world yeah. as our generation. Mm. And so there's been a lot of thought that this next generation has different styles, preferences, questions. And so everything needs to be sort of tailored to them. Yeah. But then when that generation moves on, you got to reinvent the whole thing. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting you say this is the last few decades of the church in America, at least. And yet it hasn't seemed to have been working, right? We see lots of stats, and I want to get into some of those in a minute, where the number of people who are disavowing the Christian faith, walking away from it, never, not wanting to be part of it, are bigger than they've ever been before. Yeah, the, the rise of the nuns, which is well documented and continues to accelerate. So though it's, there are examples, noteworthy ones we can point to, of very big churches with this kind of methodology, you're right, certainly s- society as a whole, it's not working. Hmm. It's not that, if we're banking on that strategy, to overcome the sinful proclivities mm. of the human heart. That's not, That's not working. Right. Let's talk about the nuns. Uh, I was looking at an article from the AP recently. They just published it last month, and it, it indicated that a full 30% of U.S. adults polled identified as nuns. Uh, that includes uh, atheists and agnostics, but anyone who uh, doesn't affiliate with any formal religious uh, identity or group. Uh, But that group of the nuns was especially prominent among young people. The same article reported that four out of every 10 people under the age of 30 would identify as a nun, uh, which is close to as many people now in that same age cohort who would identify as Christians. What do you make of that, particularly around young people? It is happening, and it needs to be considered. And I think there's, there's a temptation to make the argument And from the books I've read, they say, "Mm, this doesn't really account for most of it. There's a temptation to want to say, well, all of these nuns were probably, they weren't really Christians anyways. Mm. They were, I'm not talking about a theological sense, just like these were just people who used to say one thing and now they say something else. They were nominal. Yeah, probably nothing's really changed Mm. except their answer to the question. Gotcha. So the poll has changed perhaps. Yeah, the poll has changed because people are just, now it's more socially acceptable mm. to say, I don't have any religion. So there, that accounts for some of it, but the sociologists I've read say that doesn't actually account for most of it. Mm. There, it it's not just people who had no religiosity now daring to say it. it. There really are... There are shifts happening. There are shifts and there's decreasing religiosity. Now, if there's you know some good news or at least a little less bad news, those changes have been less so among evangelical churches than they have been among Catholics and than they have been among main lines. So it's not as bad for our kind of world, but it's still bad and it still makes a difference for the world Mm. that we're living in. I think that I was, I look at some of the things I probably said 15, 20 years ago and where I might've said, you know what, the rise of the nuns, have at it. Mm. You know, it's better. We're just, yeah. we don't have all, we're showing who the real Christians are, get rid of cultural Christianity, the light will shine brighter in the darkness. And of course, there's an element of truth to that, but I think we're seeing, you know what, a broad Christian consensus. The goal is not nominalism, of course, but a broad Christian consensus in the culture does make it easier to introduce people mm. to Christianity, to authentic. They have some cultural categories that many of these nuns now have none of those categories or are antagonistic to the categories. Yeah. And that leads to an, another question I have. It, it seems like every generation of people, in particular Christians, 
we tend to look at the next generation and increasingly as we get older, we see the differences we, we, and we sometimes magnify the differences and maybe overblow the differences between us. And we feel like they're strange. They, they don't seem to resonate with the things that make a lot of intuitive sense to us. But when it comes to Gen Z, this, this younger generation under 30, do you think there's anything to that? Is there something different about the worldview, about the culture that surrounds young people today that maybe is a pretty significant difference compared to previous generations? Yeah, that's a, a million dollar question because you're right. I mean, you, you can go read the Puritans. You can read people in the 18th century. They're, they're always lamenting. To the earliest church, they're always lamenting that we don't seem to be as godly as we used to be. Mm. And the next generation that's coming is could be the very end. It's getting bad. Now, there are seasons where people are more optimistic, but that's a strain that is there always. It's so we part need of to be getting older. We just get grumpier, I think. Yeah, and I think it's a, it's a part of the good way to say it. it's a part of getting closer to the Lord, maybe, mm. that you, you see the, the, the sinful patterns more clearly, and maybe you, we tend to look at our own past experiences with more rose-colored glasses, and it just looks bad. And we're probably, we didn't see the blind spots in our own age. Mm. So you think of somebody who maybe grew up in the 50s and 60s, you know, maybe a white evangelical, and we're blind to pervasive racism in the culture. Mm. And that person may say now, yes, I'm glad we don't have that. That was bad. But the way they look at that, it may not really register, may not really feel. What, what, what they feel is, can you believe that we have men becoming women and we have gay marriage and we have mm. abortion and we have divorce, those things. So we, we, we feel that more poignantly. But to your question, yes, there is something different. And I do think Jean Twenge, is that how you say her name? Her, yeah. her book on generations, she's right. one of the leading experts on it. And her theory is a technological theory of generational change, that it's largely driven by different technologies. And I don't think that's all of the explanation, but I think that's an important one. Mm, yeah. And that does mean that generational and cultural change is truly accelerated. That things that might have taken 100 years, maybe take 10 years, things that might have taken 10 years and take one year, it really is the case that change can happen much more quickly because of our digital age. And just you know, one example of cultural change you know, as a Gen Xer, I am conversant and comfortable and familiar with digital world. And I've had a blog for a long time and I'm on Twitter and I, I know how to work my iPhone. But I have very distinct memory of when email became a thing, yeah. and dialing up the modem and when the internet, and when you had to go to, you know, a computer lab at the college <laughs> to, to get on there and type your paper. So I remember, so I'm not a digital native. Yeah. You, like you know what are. life was like before yeah. the iPhone. Yeah. Yeah. Where none of my kids do. Mm. They, they can hear about that. Just like you and I wouldn't have any idea. We, we know there was a time when people didn't have cars. But it's just some place in the distant past. It doesn't yeah. really have any cultural pull yeah. on us. And so therefore, we, we don't change. see the cultural influence and impact that technology has on us. We don't understand it. Yeah. We take that as a cultural given. Mm. And this is where I think not just evangelicals, but just people can be naive, but evangelicals, and it gets to somewhat the point of this little book, is we can tend to th see technology as just a neutral. And, you know, Samuel James, of course, has written a lot about Digital this. liturgies. Digital liturgies. And Tony Ranke, and I had both of them on my podcast, as Tony's a little more technology positive yep. and Samuel a little more technology cautious. But it's true that we often think of them as just tools that we can use without realizing how they use us and how they change us and how they... So the car, if you just take that as a cultural given, as all of us do, of course you have a car. We don't think about... We just think, yeah, this is how I get from places. Mm. How, do, how do you live without a car? You don't think, well, what did this do to neighborhoods where people used to have their porches facing out to the streets and now they have their patios on the back towards the lawn. What did this do to, how did this make suburbs possible? How does this change how churches work and how you get to church? There's all sorts of things that are massive, that the automobile is without a doubt one of the most significant things that's happened in human history. Mm. 
but we all just grow up with it. We don't think about it. Yeah, yeah. Seems like one of the other big things that is often mentioned alongside the rise of the nuns, and in particular, the younger generations, relates to the way that people have lost a lot of respect, and not just respect, but trust in institutional organized religion, right? There's the sense that Christians, and maybe especially Christian leaders even, like yourself, are too often in it for themselves, that they are looking out for the in-group, but that anyone who's not in that inner circle is, is disposable. We hear a lot of critiques around that, and that's often cited as a reason that people are leaving the church or suspicious of organized religion generally. How would you counsel Christians who want to reach the next generation, and this maybe leads into the, the, the topics of your book, what you hit on there, how would you counsel them to think about this issue when it comes to reaching the next generation? I'm going to agree and disagree with the assessment, and I think you'll probably track with me. It's it's certainly the case that there's low level of trust in institutions. So it used to be, again, even when I was growing up, basically three networks, hmm. and three networks give you, you know, I'm Walter Cronkite. That's the way it is. That's just I'm just telling you the the way it is. And everyone tuned into that. That, yeah, that of course, one Walter cast. Cronkite's before my time, but the three networks and a kind of common culture. You're kind of watching the same TV shows. I mean, you, I just look back at, you know, what the Nielsen ratings would mm. be for shows when I was really young. I mean, you never hit anything like, yeah. you know, a 33% share or 50%. Yeah, what was like the, the series finale for Friends was this massive number that... Yeah, so even Friends. And now you, except for NFL football, probably, mm. nothing gets yeah. anywhere near because it's all very segmented and everyone's got a streaming platform and cable was before that. So that, that's just an example of when you have a few gatekeeping institutions, the positive is sort of that's where we go and we trust them. The negative is, well, what if, what if you shouldn't trust them? What if the ABC, CBS, NBC was pretty slanted in what they were doing? Mm-hmm. Well, then you're glad that Rush Limbaugh came along or Fox News came along. But as all of that proliferates, what you end up with is nobody has much trust in what somebody else is doing. Mm. So you're saying this this issue of a lack of trust and the fragmenting of these this institutional trust is it's much broader than just the church. Yeah, that's right. So it's not just the church. It's broader than that because if you want to have if you got a million people watching your television show at night, you're you're big time. Well, a million people is a lot, but it's really kind of not a lot with Mm. 330 million people. So to make it now, you just, you need a, you need, it can be small. It just needs to be committed. And so where I was saying, I agree, certainly there's a lack of trust in institutions and leaders. And there's, it's a huge populist moment right now that it was, I think no matter what anybody did was bound to happen because of the internet. Mm. You just, everyone has access to everyone else's opinions. It couldn't be otherwise, I think. And, and we all hear now the, the terrible stories that do exist yeah. uh, of things going wrong, people doing bad things, uh, but we all hear about them uh, because of the internet. Yeah, so if, if some church in Topeka, Kansas, you know, had some church meltdown with their leader, that would happen there and it would be a big deal. Maybe the denomination, would, maybe some people in town, but now, if it's the right sort of person or wrong sort of person with a platform or somebody, it's going to be news. And all of a sudden, you extrapolate. So all of us can go through the list of whatever. You just say three names and people can, wow, there's a massive problem. Mm. Well, maybe there is. Or maybe those were three big names that we've heard of. And maybe the actual numbers, if we knew them, are not any different. So yes, this is a this is an issue across the board. And why I say a little pushback, I think people people are people and they're always going to want leaders. They're always going to need heroes. They're always going to follow authority figures. So the you can find the most fever swamps on the internet, <laughs> conspiracy theory agitators of all sorts of things. And they'll have somebody in that fever swamp who's a leader. Mm. Someone whose opinion they don't want to cross. Someone whose voice in that group is taken to be very important. So anybody who starts by making a name against 
that institution, if their influence is going to endure, they're going to create a new institution and they're going to be a voice. And so it's not that people don't still have authority figures in their life. In fact, the scary thing is they have some really bad ones mm -hmm. at times. But you're right. It gives, uh, at times, a very sincere, heartfelt, and at times, I think, just a convenient out for people mm. who don't want to give the church the time of day. Or it, it leads us to reinterpret our own experience now with these new categories that in previous generations maybe was just, eh, that was kind of a, a rocky patch. And now you have a way to experience and reinterpret that experience as something much more nefarious. Yeah, much bigger. So if, that's a really helpful summary of that particular issue. And obviously there's lots of other uh, related issues that help to explain, but not fully explain the rise of the nuns and just the trends that we see more broadly in our culture today. And that kind of gets then to the title of your book, which I, I love. That's a classic Kevin DeYoung book title. So the not so secret secret to reaching the next generation. And so at the risk of spoiling the book for our readers and causing them to not want to buy the mm -hmm. book, which you should buy the book, what is that secret? It's a very short book. So it's a very short secret. <laughs> uh, and, and one level I say the secret is that there's no secret. I know I first started thinking about this, writing on it, preaching on this way back in the emergent days mm. when I... Refresh our memory, quick history lesson. What was the emergent church? <laughs> The emergent church in one sense is no longer with us, but I think the spirit of it is, mm. is there. So the emergent church was early 2000s, you might say, a, a vibe that on the one hand it wanted to, you know, do lots of creative things and worship it. So it kind of had that, we don't like seeker, boomer worship strand. There was also something more strong, authentic, more authentic. Can we, let's just draw a picture on butcher block paper as we do, but some of it wanted to recover liturgy and that was good. But then there's a, a strong social justice, anti-religious right part of it. And then there was the velvet Elvis jump. Our doctrines to mm -hmm. freeze dried, button down. Yeah. More but, Jesus, less doctrine. Yeah. Red letter Christians. We need to emerge from all that. So I wrote why we're not emergent. And that's back when I was young. <laughs> and now I'm just de-young. But people would ask, okay, all right, so if emergent's not the answer, and then I was pastoring University Reformed Church right across the street from Michigan State. Okay, you're right there with college students. And it, it was like somebody put the microphone, yeah. tell us, what's the secret? I mean, yeah. I'd almost get that question. Okay. Again, it goes back to that. Just we're always looking for the next thing that's going to unlock the current generation. Yeah, exactly. And that generation is now one or two generations. They're the old people, middle-aged people mm. now. So what I started to say back then was, well, there's no secret. I'm like, well, okay. Uh, I sort of get it, but I sort of think, can I say anything more the, helpful? The interviewee's face <laughs> fell at that yes. point. <laughs> So what I, what I wanted then and want now in this little book to reinforce is that most of what we need to do is what Christians have always needed to do. So you can you put the necessary caveats there. Generations do change. There, the answers don't change, but the questions that people are asking change. Mm. We do need to be mindful uh, we do need to withstand the t temptation to just re live in some other century and just make that. So all of so, those. So there is some contextualization that has to happen. Yeah, and I think I think Zane Pratt said this one time that contextualization is does not mean making the gospel or the truth of the Bible more palatable. It means making it more clear. Mm. So yes, if people aren't understanding what you're saying because of cultural pre preconceptions or a lack of, you know, cultural familiarity with certain ideas within Christianity, all those things could be true. Yeah. If you say our church has elders, contextualization might mean trying to explain what an elder mm. is so they don't think it's just an old person or, you know, they, you know a cult or something. But, it, 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 you know, with the gospel, there's lots of different ways to explain the gospel. Contextualization means just trying to make sure they don't misunderstand what you're hearing and in a way that they can understand, but it isn't to say, I'm not going to talk about the difficult things. Mm. I'm going to make this just as palatable and remove the scandal. So, so yes, contextualization. And I do think because I, I'm not, no one accuses me of being hip or cool, but 
I think I live a fairly normal, observant, like when I drive my kids to school, they want to listen to, I, I know some of the current pop songs, I guess, <laughs> because my kids do. I don't go see yeah. the movies, but I know what's yeah. out there. All that to say. You're not totally isolated from the I'm real world. I'm not totally, totally isolated. I'm not just living in you know, the 17th century because that's where all of my dead friends are. So I just want to say it is possible that there are people who major on the minors or they put unnecessary barriers. Mm. Okay, the, the, the gospel is a scandal in itself, but then they sort of make it like you need to enter into a cultural time warp to come into your church. Yeah. So all of those caveats, what I want to say in this book is it's mostly the same. It's loving people. See, that's why I think cultural understanding has value. We need great cultural apologists. We need the people to help us understand that. But I do want the ordinary pastor, the ordinary parent, to not feel like, oh, if I'm going to do youth ministry or I'm going to talk to my teenager, I need to read the, the French philosophers. I need to uh, you know, have an extra degree in critical theory. I need to know everything that Taylor Swift is singing about in her songs. Mm. Like you need to have a cultural refresher course every two weeks. No. And in fact, if you try too hard at that, you will seem really, I was going to say cringy, but I, I think that word has, has already passed <laughs> by. It's already passe. Yeah. So I think what a lot of Christians are trying to do with that, the good instinct is, I want you to know I care about you. I want mm. there to be a connection. I want you to, but one of the, the big things in the book is loving people is a better way to make that connection. Give people the gift of your curiosity. Ask good questions. Almost everyone likes to talk about themselves. So you don't have to be an expert in all of this and, and know how to deconstruct all of the cultural errors that are out there. Show love to people. Show hospitality. Invite them over. Ask them questions about themselves. Love covers over a multitude of cultural ignorance. Mm. Hmm. Now let's talk through that, uh, some of the other specific yeah. suggestions that you have in the book. So there's no secret, there's no silver bullet, but you do mention a few things. So the first one is grab them with passion. What does that mean? People want to know that this really matters. And the illustration I've given so many times when I preach is the story, whether it's true or not, it should be, of George <laughs> Whitfield and Benjamin Franklin. It's like the classic pastor's illustration. Yeah, if it's not true, it should be. It's true that Franklin was a fan of George Whitfield, even though Franklin was not any kind of evangelical Christian, but the story is told. Somebody said, Franklin, why, you know, why do you keep going to hear George Whitfield preach? You don't believe a word that he says. And Franklin replied, I know, but he does. Mm. The, he, he was gripped by the... the I hesitate to use authenticity because that word has been spoiled, but he really means it. Mm. He really believes and it. And you could see it. You could see it. So I think, you know, someone literally coming off the streets into our church, I think you could sing, you know, with a pipe organ. I think you could sing with guitars. I don't think it's limitless. I do think the instruments matter. But I think you could praise God in a lot of different ways. And if you have the most cutting edge music and you look in its concert quality mm -hmm. and you look around and no one's singing that communicates something and you could be in a 40 person psalms only singing church and they're singing their guts out and it's not any kind of musical connection probably with the person yet they'll sense why are all these strange people singing this strange song like mm. their very life depended on it so i that's what I mean by passion. Is there a sense, parents to child, and it's not a personality thing. I'm not saying that you all have to have a, a certain intensity yeah. of your personality. I'm thinking of like John Piper preaching. We don't need to be preaching to our kids like John Piper would preach. Glory! <laughs> yeah. Like, with all the hand moves. Right. So I think people here, no one doubted that Tim Keller really believed what he was saying. Totally different mm. personality. But in earnestness... A, and it is a biblical verse, let do not be slothful in zeal. So a sense, yes, when parents drag their kids to church and make them go and their kids sense, this doesn't mean a whole lot to my parents. They're just doing it. That is communicating more to your children than 
almost any lesson mm. you're didactically giving them. Yeah. And all parents know that. We've seen that in our kids yeah. that they tend to, to follow us, at least at a young age, in our passions. What we're excited about, they get excited about. Yeah. And it's much more caught than taught. We should still teach. We should still do family worship. Mm. But if if you do all the family worship and they don't, it's not caught in your life, it, it, it can have a negative effect. And conversely, if you struggle like our family does to get to the family worship every day, but hopefully there's a sense, well, this really matters to mom and dad and they really love us and care for us. And it's really the most important thing in their life. That's communicating a lot more than you realize. Mm. So the second thing you highlight is win them with love. We've kind of talked about that one. So we'll, we'll keep moving. Hold them with holiness. Maybe that's one that is a little more, I don't know, you kind of, where, where are you going with that? The opportunity we have in our increasingly godless age and the rise of the nuns is that true Christian virtue will stand out. Mm. It will stand out more than it used to. The, the hard thing is we can't rely on the culture to do a lot of the formation for us. I think that's where a lot of us have been, you know, whether it's the, the schools or just the entertainment or just the general sweep of things is, yeah, yeah we need to be discerning, but a lot of it is you're, you're on that lazy river, you know, at the, at the water park. It's kind of floating your inner tube in the right direction. Yeah. Even a lot of that comes through cultural taboos, things that that's right. everyone Stigmas. kind of agrees are yeah. not really good, even if sometimes we do them. Yeah, what you shouldn't laugh at, what you shouldn't show, what sort of disqualifies someone from public life. Mm. So All that is breaking down yeah, all around us. Yeah, so it, we don't have that leading us in the right direction. A lot of times it feels like you know, a, a rapid pushing us back the other way. So the opportunity is genuine Christian commitment and virtue and an objective and noticeable, though not ostentatious, holiness. That's what I mean, hold them with holiness. There's something that, I mean, this is biblical. Peter says, "Let may they see your good works and glorify God on the day he visits us. Or they'll be put to shame that even when someone opposes us, we may not see it, but maybe there's something in the back of their mind I don't know. He he is a genuinely really kind person mm. or she is the best person, the hardest worker mm. I have. I see integrity in this I, person. I, I see integrity and I think with our just with with people from the outside. That's why I say hold them with holiness, a sense that okay, I may be rebelling in my my mind and heart against these hard Christian truths and what they say about sexuality, but boy, I can't deny this is a different kind of community mm. and they do live a different way than other people do. And there's a, there's a holiness about, and, and, and some, you know, there's a number of books written by feminists right now who are kind of being mugged by reality to say, you know, the sexual revolution has been a really bad deal mm. for especially women and children. Yeah. And so I, I'm hopeful that people will see that. And it's going to be a long journey for most of them. But maybe say, you know what? You know where people actually treat one another you know where women are, are really honored, actually, mm. is in the church. And that distinctiveness, to be a distinctive people, is what God calls yeah. us to. And some of that, the, the, our drive to be holy, has to come from, though, a, a, a belief, a fundamental trust that what God calls holy is actually good for us. It's not just burdensome rules that steal the fun out of life. Yeah, uh, I mean, one of my go-to texts is, Second Peter, that make every effort to add to your faith, knowledge, and goodness, and faithfulness, and self-control, and all these things. And he says, and if you have these things in increasing measure, you will not be ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of God. It's like the, the famous saying from McShane, what my people need from me most is my own personal holiness. Mm-hmm. If it, unfru- it doesn't mean you're, you know, if a pastor, that your church will get large. It doesn't mean as a parent that you can guarantee every single one of your kids will be a a Christian, but you will not be ineffective or unfruitful. Mm. If you're bearing fruit in your own life of holiness and godliness, people will be able to pluck that down and realize it. It goes back to your first question. There's lots of ways to draw a crowd. There's lots of ways still in America to have a big church, but there's still only one way to really be truly spiritually fruitful. And that's that you yourself need to be bearing 
fruit in keeping with the gospel. Mm. And that, that's sort of what I mean by hold them with holiness. Yeah. I was struck, though, that the definition of fruitfulness matters there because, again, you yeah. see a lot of examples of worldly fruitfulness, uh, even within the church, uh, that isn't necessarily the fruit that God ultimately is giving mm -hmm. us. Uh, so last two things, we'll just we'll quickly go over the fourth, challenge them with truth. Uh, what are you getting at there? So the truth is going to be challenging. And I, I, I actually think that people are willing, not, not always to believe it, and they may hate it. I think they really want to know, mm -hmm. would you just tell me what you really, don't, are, you, are you hiding something? Yeah, don't play games. Yeah. And that goes back to a lack of trust in authority and authority figures. So... Paul gives us the answer by an open statement of the truth. So just a fastball right down the middle. Just let people know. Now, again, to be a wise communicator, I think as a preacher, I may make certain guardrail. I want to make sure that you don't misunderstand over here and over here. But we don't want to undermine the truth at death by a thousand qualifications mm -hmm. either. Challenge them with truth. Say, this is a hard thing. So I'm going to preach, um, preaching through Revelation right now. There's a lot of hard things. There's judgment, there's hell. And I'm coming to the text with, you know, a third of mankind is wiped out by this demonic horde. And it's to repent. And, and part of what that passage is saying is one of the reasons God allows wars and death in the world, the horrible things we're seeing in our world right now, mm. is to call people to repent, to say something worse is coming. Mm. I don't care how long you've been a Christian, where you live, that's a hard word to say something worse is coming. And so I, I'll try to put some, but I'll tell people that this is a hard word, but we need to get the right view of God, which mm -hmm. really leads, I just did the segue for yeah, you. Yeah, there we go. Uh, Maze them with God is your last thing. Uh, what does so, that mean? Yeah, I'm just, give you my poor man Piper's. <laughs> imitation, you know, Piper and others talk about big God theology. We live, people don't realize it, but they just, we live trivial lives. Mm. We're glued to these phones like, like I am too often to ephemera. There's a whole slew of people making good salaries to just learn the dopamine hits to just get you to do like that next cat video. candy crush do they still do candy crush i don't <laughs> even know I, uh, whatever it is and not shaming you for you know, <laughs> uh, an occasional recreation but people don't know what they're missing mm. they don't know that they need a picture of a big god so i i love what happens in revelation 2 and 3 to revelation 4 and 5 because you have the seven churches, seven real churches, and all the churches are different. They have different strengths and weaknesses. Some you might say are too liberal. Some you might say uh, don't love each love people. It captures the enough. gamut. It, yeah, it runs the spectrum of it. And so, chapter four and five come next because that's what do they need? What do they need to be overcomers? It's no coincidence. The next thing is. And I saw a vision of one who was sitting on the throne and the 24 elders and the four living creatures and the seven spirits of God and peals of lightning, uh, thunder, flashes of lightning, all of that. It's to say, you know what each of these churches, Christ gave them specific commendation and condemnation, but what all of them need most is a vision mm. of the one who sits on the throne. They need a big, big, big picture of God and of the lamb. And that's what people do don't have, and they will not, you know what, the conservative media, uh, a lot of which I agree with, they will get it right about, they might get abortion right, they might be right to, you know, tell you about the dangers of woke, they may get a lot of things, cultural flashpoint issues right, they will not mm. give you a Revelation 4 and 5 picture of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Yeah. Well, Kevin, thank you so much for walking us through this short little book that you've written and helping all of us to be a little bit more prepared to engage our culture for Christ. Great to be with you. That was Kevin DeYoung on evangelizing and discipling young people today. For more, be sure to check out his new book with Crossway, The Not-So-Secret Secret to Reaching the Next Generation. Pick up a print copy of the book for 30% off or get the ebook or audiobook for 50% off directly from Crossway by visiting crossway.org plus. If you liked this interview, check out another conversation I had with the young entitled The Graduation Speech You Won't Hear This Year. 
Follow the link in the show notes to hear why advice like be true to yourself and you do you so often leaves us feeling discouraged and empty. You can also find a link to other interviews we've done related to culture and current events. For more audio content like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, consider sharing it with a friend and leaving us a review. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's Word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.